Hello and welcome. I'm Bob Cusack, Editor-in-Chief at The Hill. Thank you for joining us for day two of A More Perfect Union, our multi-day festival where we will explore and celebrate America's best big ideas through the lens of American reinvention. Throughout our virtual summit, we're bringing together political leaders, entrepreneurs, policy innovators, and disruptors to discuss some of the most urgent issues of our time. Today's program is all about reinventing the American economy with a special focus on small business and e-commerce. How are record inflation, supply chain bottlenecks, and labor shortages affecting businesses? E-commerce sales exploded during COVID-19. So what is the future outlook of digital retail? And how can technology as a whole encourage business growth? We'll be discussing these topics today and much more. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Altria, for its support of this program. And as a reminder, we're bringing you multiple sessions of programming today and tomorrow. You can watch them all or tune in to specific segments. Go to our website, thehill.com slash events, for all the details. A few, a few housekeeping notes before we get going. You can tweet us at, at the Hill events using the hashtag, hashtag the Hill AMPU. And if you experience any trouble, with the live stream, please refresh the page. That should be a quick fix. To kick us off today with his outlook on the American economy is the 12th president of the American Enterprise Institute, Robert Doerr. He previously served 20 years in leadership positions in the social service programs of New York State and New York City. Robert, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Let's uh, start with a broad question on the economy. Where is the economy now, you know, in the wake of, of COVID-19, and, and where do you see the challenges going forward into the new year and beyond? Well, I think it's in a very precarious situation right now with interest rates rising and that putting pressure on the economy. I think too many Americans are still on the sidelines outside of the labor force and not coming back into work when work is available. I think we're providing too much uh, really government assistance to subsidize that inactivity. So I think there are some real headwinds in our face uh, that we're gonna have to face up to in the coming months. Now, having said that, I have enormous amount of confidence in the American economy and the American people. And I like the way that you open the show. We are a great country, we can do great things, but we have to get out of our, our own way. We have to regulate less. We have to uh, promote work more and reduce the extent to which we subsidize inactivity or people staying out of the labor force because they are receiving government benefits. So those are a number of things we can do, but we are definitely facing a difficult next year. And I think if we stay confident in who we are and not uh, retreat to protectionism and even further regulation and greater taxes and greater government intervention, we'll come out of it stronger. And I think stronger than the rest of the world, stronger than China, stronger than Europe, um, we have great assets, great people. We also need more people. And we have to find ways to get families to form and, and raise children. And we also need to resolve our immigration problem so that we're attracting the best and the brightest from around the world. You know, if you look at polls, even before the pandemic, there was a, a fair amount of pessimism, which still exists today, and we've written about this, about the American dream. Is the American dream still achievable? And, and what changes, I know you mentioned a couple things, but specifically, why is that pessimistic view? And, and what can policymakers do to, to make people more optimistic? Yes, you can, uh, you can have the American dream, uh, but a lot of people think it's, it's just not achievable now. Well, I think we tell them that uh, from the commanding heights of our culture, our universities, our media. Um, and I think it isn't always true. Uh, to, to some extent, uh, the left or the Democratic Party has an interest in telling Americans that they can't get ahead if they work. And the only really solution for them is greater government assistance and greater government benefit programs. And I don't really believe that's true. Our scholars at AEI uh, show persistently that people born in the bottom quintile do make it to the middle and up to the top at rates that we don't hear enough about, greater rates than you'd expect just listening to the media. So I absolutely believe the American dream is, is still alive. It does require work. It does require effort. It requires accum uh, uh, um, acquiring skills. But when you do that, the American economy offers more opportunity than I think any other economy in the world. 
Robert, obviously, last couple of years, uh, we've had uh, a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and we have Joe Biden in the White House. Um, now that's about to change in the new year. House Republicans uh, did win the lower chamber narrowly, um, but they will uh, will be in control. Could be an interesting speaker vote. But what do you think uh, now that House Republicans are going to have subpoena power, they're going to have oversight power, and that's something Kevin McCarthy, the uh, the possible, maybe likely speaker, has said is that we need to do this oversight uh, and we need to do it early in the year, so we need to get beyond the speaker vote. But, but overall, what do you think the House Republicans should do as far as uh, using those oversight powers? Well, I, I'm not a great believer in the frivolous use of the oversight powers. And some of this talk of investigations, I think, is a, a waste of time and a kind of performative politics, which has really damaged our public policy processes in the United States. The Republican House would be wise to get serious, to do a lot of things that show some seriousness. I noticed today that he appointed Mike Gallagher as the head of a special committee on China. That's a sign of seriousness. I think there's an uh, opportunity for more of that kind of activity where we're looking at tough problems. We're trying to solve them in a nonpartisan way, we're trying to solve them in a way consistent with American values freedom, free markets, limited government, but that we aren't just trying to score political points and aren't still trying, constantly trying to embarrass the president of the United States. That's not helpful. And the American people, I think, in this last election showed that they don't want that either. And I'm hoping that Speaker McCarthy or Speaker-to-be McCarthy gets that message and really celebrates the serious people in his conference who want to tackle tough problems in a way that brings us together as a country. You know, di divided government is is coming, uh, and you know, in, in prior years, certainly a lot has been accomplished. Uh, certainly, even rivals like uh, uh, former Speaker Newt Gingrich and former President Clinton were able to agree on the Balanced Budget Act, despite their tension and impeachment and all that. You know, in recent years, from a macro sense, you, you, you see the Trump tax law being passed without any Democrats. You've seen Obamacare passed without any Republicans. Going into 2023, and, and to be fair, in this Congress, there was some bipartisanship. There was a mental health. There was a gun bill. There was a transportation bill that got through. Infrastructure bill. Yeah, yeah that was big. That was big, and that's being implemented now. Um, but what do you see on the horizon uh, of a potential bipartisanship in the new year? Well, I think there's some hope, possibly, that they could do something on entitlements, uh, in, in some small fixes now that will have no effect on current retirees or even uh, uh, retiree people coming up on retirement soon, but look a little further down the line that could take us a step back from the sort of deficit debt problem we have. I also think there's some hope on um, international trade and an effort to impose um, regulations or, 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 or a, 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 a tariff even or a, or a border adjustment tax on products coming from countries that have not made the changes necessary to have a cleaner environment or a cleaner climate. So I think there's a lot of talk about that in Congress. I think there's some hope that those kinds of things could get done. Um, uh, but I and, I and I also hope that they don't do more damage. I mean, the key thing is, is that we find a way to, to, to try to hold the line on spending. We don't raise taxes and we don't add to the, the benefit spending that, in my opinion, has kept people out of the labor force because they're receiving more than they would get from work um, from government benefits. People are Some people are working very hard and getting a certain amount of money, and other people are working not at all and getting almost the same amount of money. And that doesn't seem fair to Americans. It's not good for our economy, and it's not good for the people that are receiving those benefits and staying out of work because there are enormous benefits to being employed that help people move up and advance their families. So there, I think there'll be some opportunities for pro positive progress, but I also worry about doing more damage mm -hmm. by adding to the spending that I think is slowing our economy. I wanted to follow up on that. Uh, well, you mentioned a couple issues. First, I want to talk about trade. You know, trade certainly took a hit uh, with the rise of Bernie Sanders uh, and Donald Trump. Do you think it's it's going to make a, a comeback? Because, uh, as you know, it dominated the the campaign trail in 2016, and 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 trade deals that were in discussion didn't really happen. I I'm glad you raised it. I completely agree. I think we're in a bad place with regard to trade, and I had some hope that President Biden would roll back some of the excesses of the Trump administration 
in my conversations with Democrats who are, are positive about trade, um, say that they are disappointed in it and they don't think he's going to do it. But a lot depends on him. Uh, trade is very much informed by presidential leadership and trade can be so beneficial to our economy. And uh, President Biden could do, I think, the country a lot of uh, help the country in a great way if he would find ways to reignite um, the trade that's been good for America and good for our trading partners around the world. And I'm not talking about backsliding on being tough with China. I'm talking about just a more open and free trade uh, policy that allows our country to grow. Last question, Robert. I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot. I know you like to read biographies. Uh, can, you, can you think of a bi biography or a person that maybe Congress uh, and policymakers in Washington uh, should emulate because we've got, as you mentioned, big, big issues coming down the pike. Uh, Medicare, Social Security, they're headed for bankruptcy. Is there anyone that y you've learned from reading uh, any particular biography that you think, well, you know, maybe, maybe some people should read this book? Well, David McCullough's Harry Truman is phenomenal, and Harry Truman is a good person for now. Um, he, we have enormous challenges around the world. We need a strong American president who understands our role in the world and is willing to make efforts to help the world become a more peaceful and stable place. So I, I think, um, and the other thing is he was often very unpopular. He faced a hostile Congress, but he kept his head. He kept trying to make progress where he could. He was uh, always a straight shooter. Um, I, would, I would bone up on Harry Truman a little bit right now if I were Joe Biden, and I think it would do him well. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's good advice. Maybe maybe he'll listen. Uh, Robert Dort, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me.